In this lesson, I describe asset requirements that organizations should document, manage, and follow in order to manage assets throughout their life cycles. The requirements in this lesson are data focused. Organizations must address them from planning through acquisition to disposal. They include marking and labeling, handling, classification for safe use, and storage. Marking or labeling requires placing asset classifications in plain view so anyone using or handling the asset understands distribution, handling restrictions, and applicable security levels. One way to quickly provide this information is via an application that scans an asset tag barcode. The result of the scan provides handling information about the asset. A paper tag may also be used. This is an example of what it might look like. Vendors like Microsoft provide ways to set classification levels for documents. This is an example of setting a spreadsheet at a high level sensitivity. Users must be trained on how to classify files and how to handle files with various classification levels. Once an office document is tagged, business policy controls how it is shared and how it appears when printed. This is an example of how a hard copy document might appear if labeled as highly confidential. Digital watermarking and labeling can be applied to documents, databases, and email content. Digital watermarking applies to all types of data, including databases. In addition to informing, they also help ensure authenticity. A watermark can be applied to a document, for example and the watermark could be encrypted. Data can also be tagged dynamically as it moves. In this example, the organization is using a Data Loss Prevention System, or DLP. The DLP can use lexicons and other business rules to detect data at rest and in motion. When it finds sensitive information, it tags it and takes the appropriate actions which can include rerouting data, moving it to an area of greater or lesser trust, and blocking its transit. Here a user is sending an email to an external entity. I include a customer name and her social security number. The message is scanned by the DLP system. The DLP system compares the content to entries in its lexicon. It contains patterns for matching with data content. In this case, it matched a social security number pattern with the SSAN in the message. The DLP tags the message as highly confidential. This results in the message being sent via the organization's security email system that ensures encrypted delivery of the message. Once assets are classified according to policy, the organization must create policies and procedures for properly handling data access, transfer, disposal, and storage of assets. Handling per classification must be consistent to avoid complexity and confusion. Implementation of oversight of asset handling requires user training, including the sanctions for circumventing policy-based procedures. Sanctions must be consistently applied across all employees. Data and related assets do not always remain at the same classification level. This can be caused by expiration of data value or so the organization can more safely perform business tasks. Once data is declassified, it does not require the same level of protection. This reduces protection costs. Declassification procedures should be documented and integrated with asset disposal procedures. Finally, data classification needs annual or more frequent review. Data can be declassified by changing its nature, by changing what it actually contains. This is useful for reducing the risk associated with allowing users access to view information needed to perform business functions. Methods to change data's nature and sensitivity include de-identification, obfuscation, anonymization, data tokenization, and destruction. Masking overwrites one or more characters in a field to prevent access to the entire data element. In this example, the customer's social security number is masked over the first five digits. 
The last four remain for customer identification purposes during customer interaction. Obfuscating information enables employees to see information for analysis or other purposes that does not provide what is needed to uniquely identify each customer or other individuals related to the analyzed records. Tokenization uses a tokenization solution to replace highly sensitive information with representations of the information. Employees only access the tokenized data during daily operation. The tokenization system cross-references the tokens with the highly secured database that contains the actual customer data. So let's step through an example. This is an example of how tokenization solution works. An employee enters customer data into the data capture system. The data includes the customer's real personal account number or PAN. The data capture system sends the PAN to the tokenization server where a token is assigned and the PAN token relationship is established. The data capture system receives back a token. All future transactions by employees dealing directly with customers use the token instead of the PAN. If an application, such as the settlement application, needs the actual PAN, it sends a request. If the settlement application is authorized to receive the PAN, the tokenization system honors the request. Hardware assets can be reused or tossed. In either case, close attention must be paid to what the assets contain. Before either reuse or disposal, sensitive data must be erased or purged. In many cases, disposal of storage requires destruction. For a detailed look at media sanitization, view the video shown above. Well, that's it for this lesson. If you have questions, please ask. And until next time, be careful what you click.